50. This is Dan Magnus from Los Angeles, California, and you're listening to Goat Parent TV. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to Go Taren TV today, episode number 453. I'm Taren, the traveling trainer from Atlanta, Georgia. And for the very first time, we have a new guest here on Go Taren TV, all the way from Los Angeles, California, Mr. Dan Magnus. Dan, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, you know accepting my invitation to come up here and uh, talk to us. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, we've of course uh, everybody listening out there uh, for the sake of us, you know, other people. Th th we've turned Go Terran TV almost into Glow Terran TV because uh, we've got the upcoming Afterglow fan party at the Sea coming up that we've been plugging a lot. And uh, we've had all the Glow Girls on. We've had uh, some of the Glow uh, fans come on and talk about their perspective. But here we are. Um, you know, we've got you on here. And, again, I uh, can't thank you enough for your time. Dan, since this is the first time having you on, can you please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and where you grew up, please? Yeah, I was uh, born and raised in New York City. Uh, I started martial arts when I was uh, 12 years old. Before that, I was a figure skating champion, a roller skating figure skating. My mother and father owned a roller rink, and I was a figure skater. And uh, living in New York City, being a figure skater, you know, you know, this is roller skating, not ice skating. Uh, you know, tough area. You know, you had to be tough, especially if they found out I was a figure skater. So uh, <laughs> I learned really well how to run away from people really quick. <laughs> and that was my self that was my self defense. And this I was ten, eleven years old. Okay. And huh. uh I was really good at it. So one time this one kid ran uh chased me, I ran all the way home and my dad, who's Sicilian, uh basically was home and he was like, What are you doing? And I said, uh this kid was gonna beat me up, I'm running away. Wow. And uh, my father goes, you can't run away all the time. I go, what not? It's perfectly working for me. <laughs> and my father went, one day you're just not going to be able to run, so you're going to go down there and face him and, you know, deal with this. And I went, uh, Dad, no offense, but are you nuts? <laughs> this kid's 14. I'm 10. Oh, you know, no. so he's like, well, you got a choice. Either you go down there and face him or I kick the crap out of you. Oh, my God. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Not really the keys to the car, but, you know. So I went down there, and I was scared to death. Oh. I mean, I was so, I couldn't talk. My voice would crack. I was like, so I walked up to this kid, didn't say a word to him. He looked at me and said, oh, you're not going to run anymore? Okay, we're going to fight. And I didn't say a word. I was too scared. And he was like, <laughs> back then, this is a 70, uh, this was like 67 or something. And he was like, basically, he went, you start. So I punched him. Oh. You know, usually it's push, push, push. This punch couldn't have broken it. But this kid <laughs> fell on the ground and was so freaked out what I did. I looked at my own hand and was like, oh, my God. Then I became punch crazy. If you looked at me wrong, I'd punch you in the face. Oh, jeez. So one day, uh, some kids would kind of like said something wrong to me. And I went to punch him in the face, and he was a brown belt in karate. Now, back, you have to understand, back in 67, nobody knew really what the karate phase hasn't hit yet. <laughs> there was, you know, it was mostly, everybody was saying it was judo. Bruce Lee just was Kato. Mm. You know, and that was about the only thing that was in the martial arts, because that was from 67 to 68. Now, yeah. more people were watching Batman. <laughs> you know, and uh, this kid picked on me. I threw my punch, and he blocked it and proceeded to beat the daylights out of me. Oh, no. Oh, my and God. And he beat me up and knocked me down, and my my nose was bleeding, my mouth was bleeding, and the kid who took karate was like, you had enough, and wanted to shake my hand and oh. lift me up. And I hit him in the face with a garbage can. <laughs> That's when I learned, when if you can... Lose if you must, but always cheat. <laughs> you know, and that was my street fighting thing. So then I decided, you know what, this guy was punching and he was kicking and it wasn't girl kicking, you know, kicking like a girl. <laughs> so I decided to take karate. And there was a karate school in the area and I signed up and I fell in love with it. 
And I got out of the roller skating thing. I was champion at skating, and I got out of it and decided to just devote my life to martial arts. Wow. And I got my black belt when I was 16. I was born a young, and back then, there weren't, many, there weren't kids' classes like there is now. Mm-hmm. Karate was just for adults. Mm. Wow. But this police officer uh, let me do it. And I went to John Jay College of Criminals at, you know, uh, 12 years old mm-hmm. to take just classes there. Not really, you know. And then and when I went to George Washington High School, and after I graduated, I went to John Jay College of Criminal Justice, where I've been there since I'm 12. I got my black belt when I was 16. Mm. And I got a degree in police science and kinesiology. Oh, wow. So, uh, and then I went to become a police officer in 1976. Oh. And six months ago after I got the academy, the New York City went bankrupt, and I didn't have a job. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> but my police officer thing didn't only last about six months. Uh, I had it easier because uh, <clears throat> the guy who taught the karate was the head of vice, so he was going to put me right into, not even in uniform, go right there, because he was training me since I was 12. Mm. Mm. So uh, when that didn't work, uh, I went to Atlanta. Joe Corley's Battle of Atlanta, which is one of the biggest karate uh, tournaments in the in the world, mm. and I saw kickboxing in 1976 for the first time, mm-hmm. and I bumped into a gentleman named Jeff Smith. He was the light heavyweight champion of the world. Oh wow! And I said, and I said to him, I'd love to be a kickboxer. And he lived in Washington D.C. Mm-hmm. And he said, "Well, why don't you come to Washington D.C. and we'll see what you have." Mm-hmm. Needless to say, I never knew that people always went up to Jeff Smith and said they wanted to train with him, and he was always looking for new guys to beat up for sparring <laughs> partners. So uh-huh. I, you know, went I went there for two weeks to train with him. And I got the living crap kicked out of me so bad oh. every day for two weeks by him and Michael Coles, who was the welterweight champion. Uh, all, they had all these champions in Washington. And wow. every day I showed up, and I never even got to hit them because they didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I had a little boxing experience, and I knew how to kick, but I never kicked boxed before. And this mm. was PKA kickboxing. It was above the waist. It wasn't wow. like... Thai boxing, where you kick the legs and you elbow and knee. Sure. It was a real big thing in the 70s and 80s, where you kick the... It was boxing, but you could also kick above the waist to the same areas that you could box. Interesting. So, for two weeks, I got my head... I thought my brainstem came loose, oh, the way they God. hit me so hard. Mm. But mm. after two weeks, I went to go back to New York, and right before I left, Jeff Smith goes, I have never met a person like you that, that showed devotion like this. Mm, mm. If you'd like, we can give you a job here at, at Junior Institute, which was the big karate thing in the in the country because he had eight schools. Mm. And I went, hmm. And I took his uh, thing and I went to New York, got my stuff and moved to D.C. And uh, taught karate and became a kickboxer. Wow. And uh, mm. this was in 1978. I had my first fight in Canada. Mm. And uh, I was doing really well, and then I had a chance at the world title, and I had a fight before 1982, a tune-up fight. And before the fight happened, they were doing the pre-check-in, you know, the doctors check you, and the doctor said there was something uh, messing with my heart. He huh. said, you know, and uh, they didn't know what it was. So I went through all these doctors. Now, when I was in... Washington, D.C., besides teaching karate, I also was a, like, bounty hunter. Oh. I was a fugitive recovery specialist. And uh, during one of the things, I got hit by a car. Oh and when I got God. hit by a car, I broke, I broke my ribs, and one of my ribs punctured my heart. Oh, my but God. But I didn't know that. Oh, my God. Yeah, I didn't know that. Jesus. So since I was, yeah, so since I was working for the government, they, uh, I was, uh, gone to NIH, which is the National Institute of Health, mm-hmm. and uh, government paid to see what was wrong with my heart, mm-hmm. and they went, you have a rip in your aortic valve. Oh, my God. And I went, okay. I had no symptoms. Oh, I wasn't my. sick. Uh, they just heard a, a, a flushing thing, like like a leaky valve. They thought my valve was, my valve wasn't, uh, you know, 
bad, it was ripped. Oh. So they said, they said, we have to go in there and fix that, which means usually they replace the valve. And it's an aortic valve, so it's a big deal. And I went, my first question was, well, can I fight again? Oh. Wow. And they looked at me and I went, are you nuts? <laughs> and I went, no, I want to fight again. You know, I want to be able to fight. So I bugged them so much that they just said to shut me up. Well, we'll see. Mm. And to me, that was a yes. So in uh, 1980, you know, about four months later, 1983, it was then uh, I had my heart surgery. I remember it was uh, August of 1983. I had open heart surgery. And what they did for me, instead of replacing the valve, they stitched the rip together with three metal stitches. Mm. Because the doctors said, Let's, you know, we can... NIH is a government experimental hospital, so it was a guinea mm. pig. Wow. Let's see if we can fix it. So they stitched it, and they said, I said, can I fight again? They said, well, let's see if you can get back in shape. And then a year to the day was September 1984. I uh, fought again and became the first professional athlete ever to come back after open-heart surgery. That is that incredible. Fight's on you, that fight is on YouTube. It's uh, Dan Magnus versus Tom Dalton. Mm. Everybody thought I was crazy. Everybody thought I was going to get killed. I Thank God I worked for the government because they overruled the athletic commission that wasn't going to let me fight. Mm. Mm. And uh, I won my the East Coast title and went on to win the world title. And uh, that was, you know... The thing now, there was no internet back then. Mm-hmm. There was only like cable television. So ESPN took my fight live. Mm. And now, today I get told, God, if you had the internet back then, you would have been like one of the most famous athletes in the world. But there was no internet. So it was just like I people, the karate world knew me and that. And uh, that was that. Then my last fight was in 94. And I wasn't feeling good for the fight. I was training for it, but I was always getting sick. I thought I had, you know, a bad flu or something. Mm-hmm. And when I defended the title, I passed out in the second round. Oh, my God. And uh, yeah. I, the first round came out. Now, I was fighting Ricky Haynes, who was a former world champion. Mm-hmm. And I went after him because I didn't feel good. I wanted to end it fast. Mm-hmm. And he knocked me down. And, I mean, he hit me hard. And I went down. And I got up. And we finished the first round. I sat down for the second round, and I was breathing so hard. I'm like, oh, man, this punch really affected me. And in the second round, I stood up from the chair, took two steps, and what fell down. Oh. Now, they thought it was from the punch, mm. but it wasn't. My valve ripped again. Oh, my God. So, oh. so right away, you know, within a month, I had my second open heart surgery. And oh. they took out my whole aortic valve. Mm. and put a metal one in. So I, a quarter of my heart, my whole aortic valve, is a metal valve. Wow. So And, and now I'm on a blood thinner. So they went, okay, Dan, you can exercise, but your career is over. And I went, no, it's not. And I made a second comeback. Unbelievable. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. So <laughs> he kept calling me. Anytime my... My nickname, every fighter has a nickname, and I was called Magnum because my last name is Magnus. But <laughs> after my heart surgery, everybody started calling me Dan, the Bionic Man. <laughs> I hated that one. But, <laughs> but they would just say it. I, and I hated that nickname. You know, uh, but, you know, but my whole thing was, you know, never give up. You mm. know, never give up on your dream. Keep going. No matter what. Unless, it's, unless you're dead, don't take no for an answer. Mm, what a if testament. If it can't be done, if it can't be done, figure something else out. Mm. You know, and be persistent. Persistence, perseverance, does everything. Oh, yeah. You know, I was not one of the greatest fight. I was not one of the greatest fighters in kickboxing. They were guys better than me. But nobody had my perseverance. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the champions, uh, Bill Superfoot Wallace, actually got me ready for my first comeback fight after my open heart surgery. 
fact, the funny story is we were doing an exhibition fight so I could see if I was ready, and he was the best kicker in the world. Mm. What's he doing the first round? He sidekicks me in the chest. Oh. He knocks me across the ring, right on my back. Jeez. And I don't know who, who is more scared, me or him. Mm. He had this panic look on my face like, I just killed Dan. <laughs> and I got up and went, well, I feel good. It didn't hurt. I guess I can fight. Wow. And wow. basically, you know, so anytime, you know, people talk about perseverance, Bill Wallace, Jeff Smith, and all that, go, if there's anybody that has perseverance in, you know, a sport, Dan Magnus. Mm. You know, so, and now, you know, after that, I uh, retired from fighting and got into the bodyguard business. Mm. And I was bodyguarding and also teaching uh, personal protection for bouncers in bars. And basically, that's what I've been doing from uh, back from 90, like, eight to, to now. I did a little brief stink with uh, professional wrestling. Brian Adams, uh, who was one of the uh, big wrestlers. Yeah, Crush. I lived in Hawaii for a while. Crush, I, yeah. I remember him. Uh he owned a, a world gym. Next, and when I lived in Hawaii, I opened up a karate school, and we were right next to each other. Oh, how cool. And we became good friends. Huh. We became good friends. And then uh, WWE called him, and uh, he wanted to start a wrestling school. Now, Brian was great own, owning a gym, but he didn't know how to open a, like a school, like a karate school. Mm-hmm. But he wanted to open a wrestling school. So he opened a wrestling school, and he was killing these guys. Mm. I mean, because that's how he learned in Japan. Mm. You know, in Japan, they'll break your ankle and then wait, make you wait six weeks. And if you still want to be a wrestler, that's what they did to Hulk Hogan. I remember that story. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. then you go. And I went to him, listen, are you doing this to make money? Or are you doing this just to show these guys how hard it is? Mm. He goes, well, I do want to make money. I said, well, then you got to be easier on these guys. <laughs> so when he, so one day he comes in and goes, I'm leaving for six weeks to work with WWE. Can you keep my wrestlers in shape till mm-hmm. I get back? I went, yeah, sure. So I watched him teach, and I was like, you know, pro wrestling is a stunt fight. It's basically, it's not rocket science. Mm-hmm. So I had these guys for six weeks, and I said, okay, you're going to come over to my place. I have crash pads. And you're going to do all your bumps on the crash pads. You're going to learn it because you're bumping in a ring, and you guys are always complaining you're hurting. You're losing your bump life. Hmm. So you're going to bump and practice your bumps on the crash pads. So that when you get in the ring, you'll be better at it. Six weeks go by, Brian comes back, and these guys are doing things that no, you know, he says took him four years to learn. Cool. Wow. He did it six years, and I thought he'd be happy, and he was mad at me. <laughs> he goes, Dan, you're, you're going, you're giving them the shortcut. They're not, they're not paying their dues. I'm like, yeah, they are. They really are paying their dues, and they're still here because <laughs> they like it. It's fun. Yeah. So then he got a full time thing with WWE, and I took over the wrestling school. Oh, how cool! Wow. So I had that, and then some things came, and you know, I had some personal things. In Hawaii, and I didn't like Hawaii. Hawaii is a great place to uh, to visit, horrible place to live. Mm. You know, because it's a tourist thing. You know, mm. and living there, it's like, and I was from the East Coast, so it didn't really work. So I had a black belt friend of mine who had schools in in Denver, Colorado, and I moved to Denver to work for him. Okay, but I wasn't really good with working with people, so that only lasted about six, seven months. And then I wound up opening up a wrestling school in Denver and calling it Slam City. Huh. And it became a really, really profitable wrestling school because I gave the guys what they wanted. Hmm. And I just wanted to open a wrestling school, but we got so big that we started doing, you know, I said, okay, I'll do some little shows just to give them the thing. And I used to tell these guys, listen, your chances of getting into WWE, you have a better chance of getting hit by lightning. <laughs> yeah, that's a good but, analogy. <laughs> But, you know, I'm giving you your dream of being a professional wrestler. Mm -hmm. Now, I had friends. I was friends with Eric Bischoff because he got his black belt from one of my black belts in Minnesota. Oh, how cool. And I was good friends friends with Sonny Ono. 
Oh, okay, I right. Know, mm-hmm. Sure. I, yeah. Yeah. Ono was, a, was a, a world featherweight champion. Mm-hmm. And when I was champion, and we were good friends, and he was working for WCW, yep. when he heard I had a wrestling thing, he said, Dan, do, do uh, shows. I'm like, okay, doing the shows, but they're never going to make any money because I'd have to get big guys. And Sonny Ono went, I'll talk to Eric, and we'll just send you guys from WCW. So they sent me Ernest Miller. Oh, how Boris cool. Oh, yeah. Wow. All these wrestlers, and we started, I became a promoter. And oh, I was like, my God. It's not really, but it really was to help my wrestling school. Yeah. And then the big thing came, one day I got a call from, you know, and I knew him because he used to go to my fights, Rowdy Rowdy Piper. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. Oh, Roxy's here. She just said hello. Oh, Roxy's doing a, hey, Roxy, there we go. She's doing a, a yeah, audio just, bomb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you said you did an audio bomb. <laughs> yeah, she, she did. She did. She lays the first one. She's leaving me now. <laughs> so, so Roddy knew me from fighting, and he knew me from Sonny and Eric. I did a 48, I did a 60-round exhibition fight. I did 60 straight consecutive things for help kick drugs out of America with Chuck uh, Norris's pain. Oh, how cool. And wow. uh, Sonny, Ono, Sonny Ono says, for the last 10 rounds, we'll bring some wrestlers in, and I'll I'll kickbox you, and Eric will be the last guy to kickbox you, but we won't tell anybody, because they were in town in Denver doing a show. Mm. And I was like, I went, you do know I'm doing 60 rounds. I'm going to be exhausted, and I'm going to be <laughs> kicking and punching wrestlers that don't know what they're doing. <laughs> so they brought in, you know, Adam Baum and, you know, a couple of other guys, like mm. Glacier and all that. Mm. So the last 10 rounds, I'm sparring wrestlers. And I'm exhausted. <laughs> so Sonny Ono's number 58 and or number 59. And then the final round, the 60th round, you know, they go, there's one more guy that's challenging, Dan Magnus. And I'm like, I don't know who it is. And the referee, all of a sudden, Brian Adams comes out, grabs the, the referee and throws him out and goes, I'm the new referee. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> and I'm so exhausted from doing 60 rounds. I'm like, okay, am I fighting Brian? <laughs> and all of a sudden, out comes Eric Bischoff in you know karate pants with the gloves and all that. And I'm like, you're kidding. <laughs> so right by there, we stand and we stare at each other. And, you know, we talk. We talk like wrestlers, so you don't see our mouths move, and he goes, don't hurt me. <laughs> I'm like, don't hurt I went, don't hit me hard, and I won't hurt you. So we're moving around and kicking and punching, because he was a kickboxer. He wasn't, yeah. you know, any champion kickboxer, sure. but he was a good kickboxer. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're kicking and punching, and all of a sudden he goes, kick me in the head. And I was like, I don't know if I can. I'm really tired. He goes, oh, no, kick me in the head. So I throw a kick, in and I tap him in the face, and he sold it for me. Oh, my God. He fell like a ton of bricks. I almost thought I knocked him out. <laughs> Brian thought I knocked him out. <laughs> so he's laying face first on the ground. The crowd's going nuts. We had about 300 people there oh. for this for this charity event. And we raised $15,000. Oh, my God. That's so cool. You know, so, you know, Brian bends over and Eric's like, okay, look. Well, Taking it right, just pick me up and carry me out of the ring. So Brian picks him up and carries him out of the ring, and then the thing was over. And basically, it was it was really fun, you know. Mm. And then you know Eric was like, it was a thing of me working for WCW because Eric had a brilliant mind, but Eric was such an egomaniac, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and he's going to do this storyline of he was going to fight for the world title, but I wouldn't give him a title shot. So he was the one who was behind the car that had hit me and made me have open heart surgery. Oh my God. I looked at him and I'm like, that's the most ridiculous freaking (laughs) storyline. This will probably work. (laughs) But then, and now we were going to have have the group where, you know, we were called the family, almost like a mafia group. Yeah. And we had black trench coats, and our my catchphrase was going to be, there is no justice, there's just us. <laughs> so we were going to have this big thing start at Nitro, and I thought it was going to be really big for my career and everything. Mm-hmm. Guess what happens that weekend? Oh. Columbine. 
Oh, the two guys oh, were wearing long oh. black trench coats, wearing oh. long black trench coats, and saying their justice is in their hands. Blew the whole gimmick. There was oh, no. Bad they even timing. took the coat off. Yeah, they even took the coat off Sting mm. for a mm. while. You know where he was the crow, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. he couldn't wear the jacket. So that oh, blew wow. my whole thing. And that was, if you remember, then Eric did the whole thing where he did, like, a Tonight Show gimmick. Yeah, I remember that. This was around, like, that 99, 2000. Was, yeah. Right. That's the gimmick that replaced what we were going to do. Oh, and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. That, well, that sucks. <laughs> huh. You know, so, but, you know, I've had really going. So now I've just been doing bodyguarding. I teach seminars and personal protection. Uh, it's not self-defense. It's basically... Awareness seminars. You know, mm. bodyguards and even bouncers have to be aware. It's not how good you fight. It's if you can spot something before it happens. Mm. Mm-hmm. And then end it. You know, people have a misconception of what bodyguards are. They think they're tough, big guys. Uh, the big guys are not the really good bodyguards. Because uh, if you ever look at, you know, the bodyguards like the Secret Service, mm-hmm. their job is to get you out of there. Mm. That's it. Mm-hmm. You know, they're the worst shots in the world because their job is not to shoot anybody. Mm-hmm. Their job is to use their bodies as a shield and mm-hmm. get you the hell out of there. That's yeah. what a bodyguard does. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, so basically that's what I teach people what to do. I teach them to see what it is and get the hell out of there. You know, don't let your ego get in the way and think you're a coward. You'll be alive. Mm. Now, if there's a way you can't get out of there, then you hit him. <laughs> hit him first, hit him fast, hit him hard. And then get out of there. Don't admire your work. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what I've been really doing right now. Uh, funny thing was, because of my involvement, like I said, so Roddy Piper, when I was working with Eric and all them, mm-hmm. called me up one time and said, Dan, do you have any shows going on? I go, yeah, I got one in about two weeks. Why? He goes, I want to come to it. I went, well, that's cool. You know, come down to it. He goes, no, no, you don't understand. I want to be in the show. Oh, I'm like, cool. why? Would, yeah, I go, why would you want to be in an independent wrestling show hmm. in Denver? He goes, well, I just got fired by WCW. And huh. I want to show them that I can still, you know, draw a crowd. Hmm. And I went, okay. So he, he brings me to... Uh, the Cauliflower Alley Club, because my fight, my wrestling show was two weeks after that, mm-hmm. to talk to me about it. So he flies me there, and I go there, and he basically tells me, you know, Dan, I, I want to show him I can draw. I go, well, I still have to spend money if I, if I don't advertise you, you know. I could have you, Hulk Hogan, fight for the thing if no one's going to be there. Mm-hmm. So I spent, like, almost $8,000 to promote him all over Denver. Oh, my God. And normally oh. my normally my shows had, I did really good. I usually had eight, 800 to 1,000 people for an independent show. That's very good. That's so excellent. I, 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 yeah, I rented out the National Western Complex. cost me, like, $3,000. Oh. And I promoted the crap out of this thing. I had radio guys. I had a lot of... Th- uh, friends that were DJs and they would have rowdy, rowdy uh, Piper sightings. It wasn't even in town yet, but mm. if you called and you saw Rowdy Piper, you got two tickets. Mm. So people were calling and saying, I just saw him at the coffee shop. Okay, <laughs> whatever. You know, and uh, we got 4,000 people to come. Oh my God, that's incredible. Wow. So he that's was unreal. so happy. I mean, when he came in, I said, you know what? This crowd is an independent crowd that's so used to people, promoters lying. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's make it where you don't, you're not here. And we kind of lied to him. So we had a limo drive up, and I had a midget come out dressed like him. <laughs> you know, and had a midget match and this and that. And people started getting mad. They were <laughs> booing. They were yelling. At, you know, and then during, then during intermission, you know, I thought people were going to leave. And he goes, Dan, I'm going to go out now. I go, all right, we'll play your music. He goes, no, no. I'm just going to walk out there. So he walks out at the end of, right at the end of the instrument. He walks out to the ring, walks all the way down. People didn't really get it was him. So he got <laughs> in the ring. And he's looking around, just staring. And all of a sudden, it, you could see the crowd just realize, 
holy shit, it's Rowdy Piper. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> and, he did a, and he did a Piper's pick for 15 minutes. I have no idea what he said. <laughs> I don't think the crowd knew what he was talking about. <laughs> but anytime he stopped talking, the crowd went nuts when he was catching his breath. Oh, wow. And I said, you know, but before that, I said to him, you know, are you going to wrestle at all? And he goes, no, but you know what? Have some guys run into the ring and attack me. I go, well, what reason for it? He goes, Dan, we don't need a reason. So I said to the back, who wants to attack Rowdy Piper? So the whole locker room attacked him one at a time. (laughs) I I checked him out. As they were running out, you know, baby faces, heels, they would run the ring. He'd hit them throw him out of the ring. He threw 30 guys out of the ring. <laughs> and then yells out, Dan, let's start the main event. The crowd is going nuts. And he was the happiest man in the world. Let me tell you something about Roddy Piper. He was a great showman mm. and he knew business. He was unbelievable. Mm. You know, but he had his own demons. And, you know, he talked about it. Yeah. He mm-hmm. called it, you know, the sickness. He's the one that, you know, said, you know, wrestlers have the sickness. Mm-hmm. But it was the old wrestlers that had the sickness. The ones today don't have it as bad. Mm-hmm. They play their video games. They do yeah. all the stuff. They don't do what the old guys did. Exactly. The old guys just drank, took pills because they were wrestling like crazy. The mm-hmm. new guys, they don't do it as much. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's the thing, you know, the uh, Vince knows the new guys are the new wave, you know, mm-hmm. but the old guys still have a hard time letting go, and that's why they're so bitter. Mm-hmm. I've had a very vast background. My martial arts, you know, I was well respected by the wrestlers because of who I was, and uh, I really enjoyed the wrestling thing, but, you know, it's like everything else, wrestling, kickboxing, it's a show. Mm-hmm. But if you want to be the best, you got to train like crazy and sacrifice. You know, when I trained for a fight, nothing else mattered. Mm. You know, when I did the thing for wrestling, I told these guys, listen, if you aren't going to sacrifice, you know, you're going to get a million no's before you get a yes. Mm-hmm. They want to see if you will persevere through all the crap, you know, and make it. And the ones who do, and they persevere, and they don't give up, make it. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, look at Daniel Bryan. I'm used to calling him Brian Daniels because I know his real name. Mm-hmm. <laughs> American Dragon. <laughs> yeah. I, I've known him for a long, long time when mm-hmm. he was the independent. He never gave up. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, he's, he's made, you know, he's retired because of the concussion thing, and they can't take the chance. He still works for WWE, and he's going to work for him forever. Mm-hmm. They're always going to pay him because they know how good he can draw a crowd. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, he just can't wrestle. That doesn't mean he can't run in and save somebody or do something and all that. He just can't officially wrestle because they're too scared because they're a public company. If he gets another concussion, you know, and something happens to him, you know, that's the you know the thing. Mm-hmm. It's just like. Me, I'm 60 years old now. Well, I'm 59. I'm going to be 60. Oh. And I still want to fight again. Mm-hmm. And if I could, you know, but the only reason it's really stopping me from fighting again is my style of fighting doesn't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. There are no fights where it's PKA where you're above the waist. Mm-hmm. Now they do the Muay Thai. I've done that before. I did it twice. I went to Japan. And Thailand, I went once with Benny and once with Don the Dragon Wilson. Mm -hmm. And thank God I was a better boxer because they can't box. They kicked me in the leg and it hurt my head. And I was like, you know something? I got to walk on these legs for the rest of my life. I'm not going to get kicked in the leg. Mm. And then MMA took off. And, you know, personally, I don't know this for a fact, but I do believe that Vince McMahon has the stake in U.S. State. Hmm. You know, uh, UFC is, you know, with Dana White, he's almost run like the WWE. Yeah, that's true. You know, except it's real fighting. But they don't know how, you know, 
when they did the Ultimate Fighter, it was on after Raw. Oh yeah, that's right. I remember now, that. Now I mm-hmm. I know for a fact that they had the USA Vince had USA locked, <clears throat> so they had to get his permission to let them do UFC uh, Ultimate Fighter after Raw. Mm, mm-hmm. You know. So, you know, there's always backstage thing, but now it's like the biggest thing out there. Uh, I would never do it. Uh, First off, I don't want a guy on top of me in the mount position. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's just not my thing, (laughs) you know, but, uh, you know, and people love the blood. It's a blood sport. Oh, yeah. Because they wear those little little gloves and they don't wear anything on their ankles or on their feet or anything. They get cut easy. Yeah, that's true. And that's what makes it different than boxing. Mm-hmm. You know, you can take a jab or take a couple, or take a punch to give a punch. Can't do that in UFC. Mm-hmm. Chuck Liddell is a friend of mine. Oh, he's the cool. worst box. He's the worst boxer in the world. <laughs> he, when I box with him, I go, Are "You letting me hit you?" <laughs> <laughs> but I won't fight him with those UFC gloves on because mm-hmm. he hits with his knuckle. You know, it's a totally different way of fighting. When you mm-hmm. fight with boxing clothes on, you don't even, you can't even make a fist. Mm. People don't realize that you can't make a fist, put a boxing glove on. Your hand will be open. Huh. You cannot make a total fist. So, oh. you know, I was trained by Jenks Morgan, who was Sugar Ray Leonard's boxing trainer. Oh, wow. And uh, I boxed Sugar Ray. And let me tell you something. He was the hardest hitter in the world. Mm. He hit me hard. So I once hit him with a jab because I'm a converted southpaw, and he uh-huh. was fighting his first southpaw. I hit him with a jab, and he does not like to get hit. Oh. And we were sparring really good till I hit him with the jab. I hit him with a really good jab, and I saw his eyes change. I thought he got possessed. And he pretended he hit me with an uppercut so hard, I thought my head came off. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> and I, I was so dizzy that I accidentally lifted my leg up and threw a kick at him. Didn't hit him, but just came real close to him. And he went, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I went, hey, listen, man, you hit me really hard. And I just, that was just a replay. And he's like, well, don't hit me again. And that was the joke when I wrestled, when I boxed or with all the boxers. Uh, then one day, you know, I had a manager, Ramon Bain, who uh, managed Hector Camacho, oh. who was a good friend of mine who uh, was, couldn't get the street out of him. Huh. You know, when he, when he got killed in Puerto Rico. Mm. You know how he got killed, right? I don't know he that was story. In, uh, no. Hector was, you know, this was a while ago. He was like uh. 51, 52. He, he, he couldn't get the street out of him. Huh. He, went, he went with his friend, and he was in Puerto Rico. He was on the passenger side. His friend was buying drugs. The drug deal went bad. The guy got shot, and they shot Hector. Oh, my God. In the, oh. in the head. So Hector oh. got killed in a drug deal. That's Here's terrible. a guy who made millions of dollars, gets shot in a drug deal. Oh. Because he couldn't get the street out of him. That's terrible. Wow. You know, and we had the same manager, Ramon Bain, and she also worked with uh, Marvin Hagler. And the funny story with Marvin is I sparred Marvin Hagler, and I used to say to all the boxers, now don't hit me hard. If you hit me hard, I might accidentally have to kick you. And I lift my leg up to their head to show them I could kick him in the head. <laughs> Marvin, Hagler looks at me, Marvin Hagler looks at me and goes, well, you got to do what you got to do. I went, oh, boy, I'm in trouble. <laughs> he was a machine. I mean, the guy is like the most incredible boxer in the world. But Sugar Ray Leonard does hit harder than him. Mm. Mm. You know, if you know, but these guys, but they're the old school guys that really, you know, build boxing up. And mm. till after them, that's why boxing went down. You know, I mean, you had Oscar De La Hoya, and you had Manny Pacquiao and Mayweather, but they didn't have the charisma or the thing that, you know, Hector did or Marvin or uh, Sugar Ray, you know. And MMA destroyed boxing because they became characters. Hmm. They became tattooed, shaved head, you know, mohawk characters, but they became characters. Mm-hmm. And that's what the crowd wants. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why wrestling is so big. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at, you know, take, you know, Glow. Oh, yeah. Glow ended in 88. Mm-hmm. You know, and people, it's amazing with Glow, with, uh, you know, Roxy doing the afterglow. I'm oh, yeah. amazed of the fans. 
Oh. That remember this. It, it was a cult and, following, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's like Rocky Horror Picture Show. It, it is. It really is. That's a good analogy. Yeah. These these people go crazy. When we were at the CIC, their their table, people were going nuts that the Glow Girls were there. Mm, mm-hmm. it, was, it was, you know, great. And then I was friends with uh, Lisa Vachon, you know, and she came over and goes, oh, Glow, and, you know, did that. And all these wrestlers were like, the, all the divas were like, Glow is what, you know, made, made me want to be in wrestling. It was mm-hmm. like, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. You know, so it's like, you know, and most, you know, professional wrestling should be in the, mar- you know, called like a martial art, because it is. Mm-hmm. I think I think pro wrestling is harder than kickboxing. Because mm. you've got to look like you're hurting, hurting somebody and not do it. <laughs> right, you know? exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's a true skill. It's much harder <clears throat> to learn to do that. In kickboxing, I look at my opponent. I don't get paid by the hour. Mm-hmm. If I knock him out, in you know, one of my knockouts, I knocked the guy out in 15 seconds. Oh, wow. With a spinning hook, <laughs> with a spinning hook kick. crowd went crazy. They loved the kick because they knocked him out with a spinning kick. But then they later on went, wait a minute, I paid $25 for a ticket. And the last fight lasted 15 seconds. <laughs> in pro wrestling, we can make it as long as we want. So the crowd always gets with, you know, the thing. Yeah. People, you know, I don't get paid by the hour. <laughs> I get paid whether it's 15 seconds or 15 rounds. <laughs> you know, so that's how that goes. Wow, that's fascinating, Dan. Well, that's amazing. Uh, I got to say, uh, I cannot believe uh, everything that you've done and uh, what you're still doing right now. It's just amazing. Uh, I've learned so much more about you, you know, in this past 45 minutes than, uh, you know, just from the research I've done on you. But, uh, Dan, th- I, again, I can't tell you uh, I really appreciate uh, that this uh, was truly the first part of this video blog was very inspirational. Uh, you know, the message of not giving up and, uh, you know, just trying and, and just uh, with hope and inspiration and, you know, do what you want to do and uh, live out your dreams. And it sounds like you have, and I got to commend you for that. Um, if anybody out there is listening, Dan, and uh, they want to follow you, uh, uh, let's plug some stuff here. Um, how can they get a hold of you if they wanted to directly message you or find out more information they about yourself? They go to my Facebook page. Okay. Uh, it's just Dan Magnus. Perfect. On Facebook. Uh, yeah. I have a website that I'm designing right now, and uh, it was up and then it was down. It's uh, the magnusmethod.com. It's my personal protection uh, site. Good. Uh, right now, right now it's down because they're they're redoing it. Okay. It's amazing. You get it fixed, and then all of a sudden something goes wrong. <laughs> of course, Murphy's law. <laughs> and, and, and every time I look, is one day the guy who's doing it. Why is it down? I had to do something, and he sends it back up. So I never know if it's up or down. <laughs> and uh, you know they can, uh, you know the easiest way to get me is through Facebook. Okay. Okay. Uh, one thing that I'm really lucky with is Roxy is almost like my right hand. Yeah. She yeah. she gets back to everybody for me. She she goes, Dan, you're really good at what you do. You are. You, people, you teach, but you suck at getting back. I'm old school. <laughs> Don't do not ever text me. While you're <laughs> texting me, I will call you and say, what do you want? Well, Dan, I text. I know. What do you want? Did you read the text? If I read the text, I wouldn't have called you. What do you want? It's called a phone. <laughs> I'm talking to you now on a flip phone, <laughs> like a 1995 flip phone. That is that awesome. It costs me $5. <laughs> I can't text because I have to press the button to get the P like, or get the O 12 times. <laughs> you know, if I do text you back, it's okay. <laughs> yes or call me. Excellent. I like talking to people. I hate you know, I call email evidence mail. Oh, I'll tell you, now it's, and, uh, and, and that goes for people who want to tweet at you too, right? Uh, I, I'm yeah, sure that... <laughs> I, I don't, yeah, I, you yeah, know, Roxy tweets, I don't tweet, you know, you know uh, the thing about it is, I, I feel, you know, people get brave on that, you know, if you want to say something to me, and or you have a grief with me, or you have something, talk to me. Very good. Say it Excellent. to my face or talk to me. 
Love don't it. write it down. I hate people to do that because, you know, that's the problem. That's why I think there's more violence out there. People are losing their communication skills. Yeah, things get lost in I translation. Th the context gets teach, mixed up. You're I teach right. bouncers and they don't know how to talk out of a fight. They think they have to fight. Mm -hmm. They talk your way out of it. Convince me. If you want a job with me and you want to be a bouncer or you want to be a <laughs> you better learn how to talk. Communication. Yeah. Yeah, key. I don't care how well you fight. Mm -hmm. You know, if you fight, you screwed up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's unavoidable. Sometimes you just can't reason and then you just do what you do. And I'm only five foot ten, mm. and I'm 170 pounds. Mm. But when people hear Dan Magnus, especially in the bodyguard business or the personal protection business, they must think I'm like six four, two fifty. <laughs> and then when I walk in, they go, "I get the the roadhouse thing. <laughs> oh, that's should be bigger." <laughs> and that makes them more scared of me because they go, "This guy's five ten and 170, has this reputation." I'm not messing with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You know? So, you know, <laughs> and the only one that, that gives me grief is Roxy, because she can. She goes, you're, you're such a pussy cat. I'm like, yeah, well, don't tell anybody. She goes, no, I just wouldn't want to see you really pissed off at somebody. I go, yeah, well, I'm getting too old for this stuff. <laughs> People go to me now, if a big two or three guys were to come at you, what would you do, Dan? I go, I'd shoot him. <laughs> they go, you wouldn't use your martial arts? I went, uh, no, I'd shoot him. <laughs> or I'd hit him with a brick. Or anything else that I'd get in my hand. Oh, okay, it's... this is not a competition. Right, if exactly. It's street, if it's street, you put something in my hand, I'll kill you with a sugar pack. <laughs> I demonstrated that once. Somebody said to me, you said you could kill somebody with a sugar pack. And I go, yeah, I could. And he goes, how would you do that? So I grabbed his nose. And he opened his mouth, and I sh shoved the sugar packet in his mouth, but I held on to it. I said, now, if I had let that go, you'd have choked on it and died. Oh, my God. Oh, my wow. God. This, this guy panicked. <laughs> and then the guy was like, he was my biggest thing to help my seminars. <laughs> this man could take anything in his hand to kill you with it. Oh, <laughs> that that is amazing, Dan. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, that, that is tremendous. I love it. I, I, I mean, I think that, uh, again, this – past uh, 45 minutes or so has just flown by so quickly for me because, again, uh, the stories you have are just amazing. And uh, I'm, I'm so thrilled that we were able to have you on here for the very first time. And, uh, Dan, let's definitely set up a time so we can get you back on here again because I've just truly amazed, just very amazed with this uh, blog uh, talking to you here. And, and it's just re refreshing to speak to you here. Well, thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, you know, thank you. Uh, the pleasure's all mine. And, um, Again, keep up the great work out there in L.A. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, I, I know you're keeping Roxy Astor straight. I know she's keeping you in line, too. So no, she's think... keeping me in line. <laughs> it, it, you can't keep Roxy Astor in line. Well, that's... You, that, that, that just doesn't work. No, I'm, I can imagine. I just tell people, you're on your own. Don't bother me. <laughs> Oh man, well, well, hey Dan, listen again. Thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your schedule, and uh, let's please connect so that we can uh, get you back on for a follow up. Because I got a million more questions for you, uh, and I'm sure you've got uh, some more stories to entertain us oh. with uh, here. This is just tremendous. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure, uh, Dan. Well, thank you again, and um, again, have a great rest of your weekend, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. All right, everybody, there you have it. That was the bionic man himself, Magnum, Dan Magnus, right here for the very first time on GoTerran TV. And, Dan, if you're watching by chance, thank you so much. Keep up everything you're doing out there in L.A. And, uh, again, what an amazing individual, folks. So uh, for the folks going to the Afterglow Fan Party at the Sea, you will be seeing Dan Magnus along with Roxy Esther and all the other glow girls there on the cruise ship. You don't want to miss that. So thanks so much for watching, folks. Um, wonderful audio podcast with, their, with Dan Magnus. Can't wait to have him back on here on GoTerran TV. So folks out there, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Make sure that you stay connected with www.goTerran.tv and bookmark that website as a favorite to your web browser today. 
And also, if you're not doing so, please make sure to like Gotieran on Facebook, subscribe to Gotieran on YouTube, and follow Gotieran on Twitter. And that will keep you connected with the master of the personal training universe, Taren the Traveling Trainer, who invites you to watch our next video blog right here on Gotieran TV. As I always tell you, it's your time, it's your investment, it's your life. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.